Hey, this is Trey. Thank you for joining us for another Thursdays, really Thursdays with Mary Langston, but um, she's kind enough to let me have kind of a bit role in that drama. So I think she's with us now through the miracles of modern technology. Mary Langston, is that you? Hey, Trey, how are you? I'm doing great. I hope you are. How was your weekend? Yes, sir. It was great. How about the Cowboys? Cowboys look great. I hate that little fight at the end of the game, which, of course, the Giants started. And I don't know why the Cowboys were flagged for any of that. It all looked like self-defense to me. But, yes, Dallas <laughs> uh, looked really good. My beloved South Carolina Gamecocks um, did not look uh, really good um, at Tennessee. Alabama lost uh, to A&M. And, uh, and Notre Dame won. So it was, other than Dallas, it was a bleak weekend for me. Well, at least Dallas got a win. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I love about you. You always find the one bright spot in an otherwise miserable. <laughs> oh, Phil Mickelson won a sen- uh, senior golf event, too. So I like that news, too. Yeah, that was good. So other than that, um, from a sports standpoint, uh, yeah, Dallas is off to, uh, to a great start, and I can't wait to see how we uh, mess it up. Oh, no, don't say that. Well, look, I've been a Cowboys fan since 30 years before you were born, so Aww. it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Oh, goodness. Well, I'm just glad they won, and they've been winning. They've been in a little streak. We are on a streak, and it's made Senator Scott and I very, very happy. We talked at great length last night about how happy we are, and it's it's sort of sad, I guess, that two men our age, our happiness ebbs and flows with how Dallas does, but um, <laughs> but it does. So Well, that's good. You ready to start some questions? I don't know. Uh, if I know the answer to them, I'm ready. If I don't know the answer to them, then I will probably – Hit the pause button and see if I can go figure it out. Sounds great. We have several today. Let's get started with our first one. Our first question is from Helen in California. She asked, in one of your podcasts, you mentioned that there's no place like South Carolina. We will be going there in November and are wondering what are the must visit places in and around Charleston? Oh, Helen, I'm I'm embarrassed to say I know a lot about the golf courses down there. (laughs) Um, I'm happy uh, to recommend some golf courses in terms of things that would be like educational or fun. I'm going to try to think of how Tim or Terry would answer that question. There's a place called the four corners of the law in Charleston, which I think Mary Langston is where state municipal county and the federal uh, sort of seats of justice converge in mm-hmm. this one little area. I think that's really neat. And everything in downtown Charleston is beautiful. Everything. Mm -hmm. The battery is beautiful or the place they call the battery. Um, So you should definitely see that. Uh, Ravenel Bridge is awesome. And I don't like to drive across it. I'm a little nervous about that. But walking across it, or if you happen to be a runner, see tons and tons of people walking across Ravenel Bridge. The market is historic and you know, is a you know, pretty good reminder of the pain of yesterday and how it's been replaced with promise. Patriots Point is uh, a really beautiful, historic place. A Yorktown, a USS Yorktown also. Kiowa is about 20 to 30 minutes south of Charleston, but it's beautiful. And uh, and you should do that if you have time. And then the last couple of things I would mention, there's an aquarium down there mm-hmm. that, that Terry tells me our kids loved. I mean, I went, but I wasn't paying attention to the tour. She thought it'd be nice for the kids to like learn something or see animals. I thought it'd be more important to go back to the hotel room and watch sports. So I think they had a great time. Um, she says they did. And then the ghost tours, there are, you know, you can take a, um, a carriage ride with a horse drawn carriage. Um, and you know, you've got, you know, the moss hanging from the, hanging from the trees. You got the moon sitting up there and you go on a little something called a ghost tour. People tell me they love that. I'm not, I, I've met all the ghosts I want to meet. I'm not looking to meet anymore. So you won't see me on a ghost tour, but people say they love it. 
Well, thank you, Trey. And thank you, Helen, for your question. I'll also add Magnolia's is a wonderful restaurant. Yeah, I've heard. I mean, honestly, if I were in Charleston, I would hop in the car and drive to the upstate of South Carolina and meet the two (laughs) kindest people on the face of the earth, which would be Terry and Mary Langston. That's what I would do if I were in Charleston. But if you're going to stay in Charleston, it is a beautiful, historic city. You can learn Mm -hmm. a lot, but just the just the aesthetics are just so unbelievable in Charleston. We'll answer more of your questions when we come back. Our next question is from Mark in California. He asked, if Andrew Yang or anyone else gets a third party candidate elected for president in other offices, how will that affect congressional committee appointments? Uh, It really wouldn't have any effect unless the members of the House or Senate also ran under that party. Uh, And it would depend if there were, you know, and what I mean by that is it would depend if there are third party candidates that caucus with the party. So you have right now two parties, Republican and Democrat. I think there are actually, what, maybe two senators now that identify as independent, although they caucus with the Democrats. So I could certainly see if there was like a Green Party candidate that was elected or Andrew Yang started a party. My guess is they would caucus with the Democrats. And if there were like Ron Paul, if he started another party, or someone, you know, thought that the Republican platform was insufficiently conservative and moved to the right of that, they would probably caucus with the Republicans and build a coalition to be in the majority. All that matters in the House, I'll speak about the House more than the Senate, although I think it's also true of the Senate, is just being in the majority, being in power. And if that's with all R's or D's, that's fine. And if you have to build a coalition, And committee assignments are based on that majority. So if you had, you know, eight different political parties, but, you know, five of the eight kind of trended center right, they would caucus together to assume the power and they would elect a speaker, none of which, by the way, is ever going to happen. Because with that many voices in the room, they're not going to agree on anything. I mean, the Republicans and Democrats can't agree on anything right now. I mean, look at the Democrats. You know, you got a a battle between the progressives and what they say are moderates or centrist, although I hate those. I hate those titles. Mm -hmm. Even when the Republicans were in power, you had the Freedom Caucus, which I think at one point was about 40 strong. And then you had something called the Tuesday Group, which were considered to be more moderate Republicans. So they they kind of caucus together, but but they also do their own fair share of fighting. So the first thing you got to do is see if you can get along enough to say we're going to be in power together, elect a speaker, and then you start populating the committees. So yes, yeah, so I saw that Andrew Yang was start you know thinking about starting a third party. You know Ross Perot had a third party. What to watch for is who they caucus with. Angus King in Maine says he's an independent, but he caucuses and throws his support behind the Democrats, which is why Chuck Schumer is the majority leader and why they get to pick the committee chairs. And same would be true in the House. So, you know, probably won't happen in my lifetime, but may happen in yours, Mary Langston. You may see these parties get strong enough to elect their own candidates. Next question you need to ask is, who are you going to caucus with? Okay, thank you so much. Our next question is from Wayne. He asked, what is the most trusted communication news source in your opinion? Uh, Wayne, I cannot truthfully answer that question. There are people I trust, but I cannot tell you to go to this paper or this website or this channel, and all you will get is the truth. Um, And also, I think one other thing, that sometimes gets lost, but it's worth keeping in mind is those entities, those papers, those websites, those channels, they also get to decide what is newsworthy. For the full podcast, go to foxnewspodcast.com.